So we're absolutely delighted, um, those of us that, have, that are on the call, to welcome Brian Chenier of Blesma, and actually also his boss. So he's just said, um, John Bryant, and before you joined John, it just meant that Brian has said he needs to tell the truth. Um, Blesmo is the British Limbless Ex Servicemen's Association, and um, they're going to talk to us this evening about about what they do, about um, their work, and hopefully some of the the impact of what they do um, on the lives of of some of those ex servicemen and women. Um, I'm really delighted to say that as pattern makers, we have our imme our immediate past master Jennifer and our senior past master Stuart Lamb, who've sort of picked up the baton. Um, Brian tells me from, from something that started about five years ago, um, and the relationship really seems to be going from strength to strength, which I think is fantastic to hear. Um, so without really any further ado, Brian, I'm going to hand over to you, um, and I think you're going to share your screen, and then um, Brian's going to talk to us for about 35, 40 minutes, um, I understand, and then um, we're just going to open the floor up for any questions, if anyone has any. Brian, the floor's yours. Thank you, Sarah. I'll just deal with the technical issues of sharing my screen to make sure we get that sorted. And so, so you should now just see a slide that says Blesman the Limbless Veterans and a black and white picture. Is that correct? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. So um, first of all, I'd just like to say it's an absolute pleasure to have been invited to talk to, to yourselves this evening. Uh, I'm also delighted for it to be recorded so it can be shared. Um, and I would just like to also say thank you to my chief executive, John, for, for joining us this evening. I know he had other commitments, and I think it's just testament to the relationship that we're trying to build that uh, John's found time to join us as well this evening. So you, you mentioned that Blesman is the British Limbless Ex-Servicemen's Association, uh, which is a bit of a mouthful to say um, in anyone's book. So we tend to just say Blesma the Limbless Veterans now, but there are some really good reasons why we've, we've used the shortened version. For many centuries, the British government have used soldiers from foreign lands to fight our wars alongside us, um, and most notably the Gurkhas, but go to pretty much any conflict that the British Armed Forces have been in. We've, we've relied on um, foreign service men and women to support us in our campaigns. So our members aren't just British. We also support, in, in the more recent decades, those servicemen and women who've lost the use of their limbs or the function of their limbs. So not all of our members are limbless. Not all of our members have been discharged from the military. They may be on, uh, undertaking ongoing rehabilitation um, through Stanford Hall. Or following their rehabilitation, they might actually be able to continue to serve a full career. And our, uh, our last general secretary, uh, the late Lieutenant Colonel Jerome Church uh, actually was injured as a, as a second lieutenant in Northern Ireland in the early 70s and served a full career leaving the army as a lieutenant colonel. So they're not all ex-service, they're absolutely not all men, but we are still an association and that's an important distinction. So we're currently celebrating our 90th anniversary of being a national charity. Uh, we were afforded national charity status in 1932 but Blesman was formed in the years following the end of the hostilities in the First World War, at a time where there was nearly 18,000 charities that were set up to support the, the men that returned from the front line. And they returned to a land that was supposedly fit for heroes. Of those 18,000 charities, there's around 10 that exist today, uh, and we're one of them. We're dedicated to assisting our serving and ex-service men and women who've suffered life-changing limb loss or the use of a limb loss of an eye or loss of sight in their communities where they where they feel more comfortable and i'll talk a little bit about how we do that in a moment but our mission then hasn't changed much um, to what it is today and that is to assist limbless veterans to lead independent and fulfilling lives now although we have a defined mission what we don't do is define what independence and fulfillment means to our members. For some of our members, their Everest literally is Everest. And we've recently had one of our members who has loss of sight, who's recently, actually yesterday, summited Mount Everest. 
But for some of our members, their Everest is going into their own kitchen while their partner or carer is out for a couple of hours and making their own cup of tea. We all have an Everest, but it's not always a mountain. And fulfillment, I think you'll all agree, is an absolutely personal thing. Some of our members get a sense of independence and fulfillment from driving to Salisbury Plain, getting into an aircraft, flying to 13 and a half thousand feet, and then willingly jumping out of the bloody thing. And from that, they get a sense of independence and fulfillment. And I use that little story as a really nice segue into my journey with Blesman that started nine years ago. I was approached by a double above knee amputee, uh, who was a former member of the Parachute Regiment, who is a world champion free fall skydiving um, participant. And he asked me what I thought disability meant. Now I knew that this was a trick question. So I just played a little bit ignorant and said, well, what does disability mean to you? He said, well, I'll give you an example. He said, people look at me as a double above knee amputee and they class me as disabled. And I actually get disabled living allowance and I get a blue badge so I can park in disabled parking bays. But if you joined me in that aircraft at 13 and a half thousand feet and we both jumped out at the same time, but you didn't have a parachute, you'd be the one that's disabled not me. So in Blesma, we tend to think that injury and illness shouldn't disable people. The disabling factors in most people's lives are the environment and maybe the challenges that they set themselves. And by assisting our members to lead independent and fulfilling lives, our job really is to remove those disabling factors and help enable people to live independent and fulfilling lives. So how do we do that? What's the proposition? What do we offer to our members? Well, first and foremost, we offer fellowship, a fellowship of shared experience. As a charity that's been going for around 100 years, we do have members of uh, significant age, and we also have members who are injured really early on in their military career. So our ages span from around early 20s to very late 90s, um, and we do have some that are on the cusp of 100 or 100 plus. Now, although their injuries might be different, and in certain circumstances, the mechanism of their injury might be different. The one thing that they've all shared is that service to the crown, that service to the country. And it's important that we introduce members to each other who might be on different parts of the journey. We offer advice on prosthetics and mobility aids and provision. Uh, when, you, when you become an amputee, uh, or you suffer a spinal cord injury or another significant injury or illness that affects your mobility. It's probably the first time you or any, anyone in your family has ever experienced, you know, which can be a very traumatic um, and very scary place to be. But it's not the first time that we've ever dealt with this. And that's something that we're, we're quite proud of that we deliver, is that advice on prosthetics and mobility. The NHS is very good at providing what people need as long as they ask for it but if you've never done this before what do you know what to ask for and, and that's particularly my job we offer advice on pensions benefits and the compensation schemes that are available at, at any given time but what we don't do is we don't offer financial advice so we will support people in accessing the benefits that they might be entitled to and help with any of the form filling that they might need but when they've got their compensation payout or their benefits, we don't tell them how to spend it. That's just not what we do. But we will refer them to the, 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 the Forces Pension Society uh, or, or various um, financial organisations that support veterans. A large part of what we do is we offer financial grants to reduce the impact of disabling injury or condition. Uh, an example is a gardening grant that all of our members are entitled to apply for each year, which just gives them, uh, it's about £400 now, I believe, it's just gone up, gives them the ability to get in a gardener just to keep their outdoor environment of their home in good condition so that on days like today in North Essex, where it's glorious sunshine, if they can't get into town or into the park, but they can get into their garden, we believe that it's really beneficial to their health and well-being that that's a nice environment and a safe environment to be in. We offer a very broad range of member activities uh, and where possible, we encourage our members to get qualified to be able to lead these activities. Going back to this idea of fellowship and member helping member. 
And I'm going to talk a little bit more about our activities uh, because it's one of our unique selling points as a, as a charity uh, that we provide. We refer to other expertise. We know which lane we're swimming in and we tend to stick in that lane, which is why we've probably lasted nearly 100 years. Uh, and we will go to other organisations, whether that be statutory services or other charities, um, where our members need their particular expertise. Mental health is a, is a particularly prevalent issue and we refer to, uh, to others for that. We offer independent advocacy. So we, we act as a voice for our members, whether that be individually at limb centres or wheelchair services or with GPs, local statutory services, etc. But from that independent and uh, very individual advocacy, we start to see patterns developing in statutory services and we then use our historical might to campaign for change where change is necessary. But when it comes to advocacy in Blesma, that doesn't mean that we will always jump up and down and shout the loudest and hope that we make the biggest change. It's a little bit more nuanced than that. And we certainly believe that sometimes the answer is no. And as a charity, we'll then work with our individual members as to how they can best cope with that answer if it's no. An example of where we've had real influence in change is in recent conflicts, servicemen and women were being issued microprocessor controlled knees, as you can see in this picture with, with Mark there. These knees were used by the MOD because the main aim of MOD healthcare is occupational healthcare is to try and return the person back into service or at least into civilian life as capable as they possibly can be. Well, these items weren't available on the NHS at all. And over four or five years with our veterans entering the NHS with this technology, civilian patients and some of our members who weren't war injured were asking why they couldn't have microprocessor needs. And we were able to join forces with other organisations and successfully campaign and help write the policy. Um, so that technology is now available to NHS patients across the UK. We offer assistance to the most infirm and our elderly members, uh, and we do that on a very individualistic basis. Um, again, resorting to our mission, which was to help our members lead independent and fulfilling lives, whatever that means for our members and their families. And again, almost going full circle, we offer as many opportunities as we can for our members to volunteer to help other members, whether that's somebody who can drive a, one of our other members to an event or to a medical appointment, where we can use our members so they can give something back, we absolutely do our best to try and do that. So it's important to talk about money and where we get our funding from. Um, we don't receive any regular or permanent government funding. We're an independent charity in that respect. We have in recent years benefited from one-off uh, and quite significant grants from HM Treasury uh, to, uh, to run various projects. Uh, the most notable one was to um, employ outreach officers to support our support officers in the regions um, to conduct local engagement events uh, and to reduce social isolation. Uh, when the funding for that was, uh, was ended, our board of trustees, uh, quite rightly in my opinion, um, continued that funding and those people are still employed and making a massive impact to our people on a daily basis in their local communities. But like most charities, we benefit from individual giving, um, collections. Um, our collection point at Canary Wharf, now we've got a chip and pin reader, is, is really lucrative. Uh, we have and we host fundraising events uh, of all kinds of descriptions. Loads of different groups and organisations choose to support Blesma in particular ways. Uh, and you'll see at the bottom, I've put there the Worshipful Company of Pattern Makers. Um, and I'm going to talk about how you're supporting us and, and uh, give you an example of that in, in real time uh, just shortly. Again, as an organisation that's got longevity, nearly 100 years, we, we do benefit significantly from our members leaving legacies or uh, to us when they pass on. Um, and those legacies are, you know, they're, they're invested over time. And as I said, one-off grants or special projects. So I just want to talk a little bit about the collaboration uh, with the Worshipful Company of Pattern Makers. So uh, 
in essence, we, we were approached by, by Jennifer and Stuart to say, look, historically, we've been doing some work with the defence recovery at Stamford Hall now and previously at Headley Court, uh, where we've provided access to uh, bespoke footwear for people with amputations uh, or with lower limb um, deformities, particularly uh, the feet. And specifically with Bill Bird Shoes and his team down, down there in their little hut. So the task for us really was to, to understand what that collaboration actually meant. Um, and then my task was to go and find um, any of our members that might benefit from, from that very generous uh, and very genuine offer. Not long after that relationship was kind of cemented uh, and I'd visited Bill Bird Shoes to find out exactly what they do and the level of expertise and um, experience that they can bring to this. I was I was made aware of one of our female members, Michelle, who's in the picture there wearing her Blesma t-shirt. Now Michelle is a single above knee amputee and uh, there's not any there's nothing wrong with her remaining natural limb apart from it's too short. So the NHS have provided her with a microprocessor controlled knee and they've made it as close a match to her natural limb in leg length as they possibly can. But the microprocessor knees and the foot unit that you can see in the picture, they're off the shelf. They are a finite size. They don't go any smaller. And because Michelle is quite short in stature, that's left her now with a 18 millimeter leg length difference. Uh, but she absolutely needs the prosthesis. So we approached Bill Bird Shoes, we got Michelle down there, they've measured her up and working directly with Michelle, uh, they're going to make her a pair of um, Chelsea boots, plain Chelsea boots, but to correct that leg length difference. But what does that actually mean to Michelle? In her own words, it will be life changing. She's in constant fear of falling because she's off balance. And because of other comorbid medical issues, for Michelle, falling can be incredibly dangerous. The opportunity to benefit from this collaboration is life changing. Uh, and we will be telling her full story and the full story of that collaboration in her future Blesma magazine. So on Michelle's behalf, already, thank you. You are already making a difference with the offer that you've provided, with, provided us. So I want to talk a little bit about our activities. Um, Ski bobbing. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of ski bobbing, but it was a, a sport, an alpine sport invented um, by amputees, for amputees. The gentleman in the red jacket is a guy called Henry Wooger. He's not a military veteran, but he is a survivor of the Holocaust. Uh, and he saw uh, Blesma on the, um, on the slopes in um, Solden in Austria um, and thought that there's, there's got to be a better way of getting these men and women down a mountain safely but by having fun. So he invented ski bobbing. Um, and in that picture, he was uh, 94 years of age and he's still alive and still going. I've tried ski bobbing. It's probably the best fun you can have in the snow with your clothes on. Scuba diving and skydiving is a very, very popular activity within Blesma, um, partly because it's really good fun. And a lot of veterans do like to, uh, reinstill a little bit of uh, adrenaline into their lives. But as I mentioned earlier, skydiving, if you ain't got a parachute, you're disabled. If you've got a parachute, you're on the same playing field as everybody else. And scuba diving's the same. We weren't designed to breathe underwater, but give somebody the right equipment, they're not disabled anymore. In recent years and responding to our membership, um, we've put a particular focus on supporting our members and their families through a series of events and this picture is a picture taken on one of the family glamping trips we take the families up to um, up to Cumbria uh, we take them into the Lake District we get them walking around we get them on and off boats we get them playing with their kids we do barbecues we do all the things that most people take for granted and we put the families into situations that they probably would never have done themselves and we fully fund it but one of the great things about this activity is it gives the children an opportunity to know that their mum or their dad isn't the only person living with limb loss and therefore they're not alone. And it's a great opportunity for these families to get together and make lasting links. Um, 
And I'm sharing that picture, not because I'm in it, but I think that picture sums up the impact of taking families away on a trip. So I want to talk about Reg. In this picture, Reg was 97 years of age. Reg joined the King's Royal Rifle Corps in 1943. He tried to join in 1941, but he didn't get past the selection stage because he was obviously far too young. But as soon as he was able, he joined the King's Royal Rifle Corps and on completion of training, about two weeks after D-Day, he landed with his battalion in Normandy. And over the next few months, in his own words, he had quite an easy time of it because the hard work had probably been done. Reg found him and his platoon stationed on the banks of the Rhine in September 1944. And his job then as a platoon commander was to secure the bank so that paratroopers returning from the failed Operation Market Garden could safely cross the Rhine back into, um, into our lines, regroup and then re uh, and go and carry on fighting. Once this task had been completed and Reg's platoon was withdrawing, an enemy machine gunner opened fire and Reg was hit six times in the groin, which completely severed his arteries and his nervous system going down to his leg. He was recovered, repatriated, and he got his first prosthetic limb at Roehampton Limb Centre. Reg joined the civil service and had a full career with the civil service. And every year would send a donation by check to Blesma. Because in his words, he knew what Blesma did, wanted to help, but didn't need our help. In 2019, Reg, now living alone in Hunstanton in Norfolk, realised that the prosthetic leg, leg that he'd been given by the NHS, which was a modern, modular type prosthesis, just wasn't working for him. He didn't feel safe or comfortable on it and therefore stopped leaving his house and wouldn't go to the limb centre to get it corrected. After a while, Reg realised that this was putting himself at risk and in danger, so he rang Blesma and said, now I need your help. Myself and my colleague, his Blesma support officer for the Eastern region, were able to go and see Reg, find out what the problem was. I was able to convince the NHS limb centre in Norwich to send a prosthetist and a technician in a van to come and see Reg at home, something that they're not commissioned to do. But because Reg was a Blesman member, and I made probably quite a convincing argument about the, the, uh, the, the, the downside of not doing what I was asking, they sent a prosthetist out, they made him safe. And from that, we were able to get Reg out of his house into the limb center so they could make the limb that you can now see in the picture. This also enabled us to get Reg out to Sandringham on a nice sunny afternoon for an afternoon tea and an ice cream. And he told his story of his wartime exploits to our in-house journalist at the time. With his permission, we shared this story with his wider family. We were able to get his family to apply for the Legion d'Honneur from the French people. We got his war medals out of the boxes that they'd been sent to him in and we got them mounted for him. And we arranged in the October for the general, the Lord Dannett, to present his war medals and his Legion d'Honneur in front of the mayor and lady mayoress of Kings Lynn and Reg's extended family. He was also able to go and celebrate his 98th birthday with his extended family, something that he didn't think he was ever going to be able to do. When General Dannett presented Reg the Legion d'Honneur, he asked him specifically, was there any message that Reg wanted sending back to the French ambassador in London to be sent back to the president of France? Now I'm cleaning this up a little bit, but Reg's reply was, it's only taken them 75 years. Uh, and Lord Dannett being a soldier's soldier appreciated that sentiment. Because we've made these links between Reg's military career, his military history, and in my opinion, showed his family that he was a proper and bona fide war hero. When Reg passed away on the 11th of the 11th that year, quietly in his sleep, we were able to help his family organise the funeral that not only Reg wanted, but Reg deserved. And he was laid to rest with full military honours 
as befitting a man of his generation in service. The popular media love to tell stories about our modern veterans, our younger veterans from conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the media quite rightly at the moment is full of stories relating to the Falklands War 40 years ago. But I wanna tell you about one of our other members now, a member called David. David served a distinguished career in Her Majesty's Armed Forces for 27 years. And following his retirement, he immediately started work at the Tower of London as a yeoman warder, bodyguard to the Sovereign Extraordinary, or Beef Eater. 15 years into his service at the Tower of London, David started to notice that he was getting pain in his lower limbs. Standing and walking for long periods was becoming more difficult for him. He took the difficult decision to retire from the Tower of London, giving up the accommodation that comes with the job, and moved out to Essex to be near to one of his sons. Not long after, he was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And the inevitable happened a couple of years later, his lower left leg was amputated because of complications following diabetes. David became a Blesma member because having served in the Majesty's Armed Forces and now living with limb loss, he was entitled to their support. David's Blesma support officer assisted him and his wife, Margaret, to move from their privately rented and unadapted home into a council bungalow, which was suitably adapted for them. Helped with all the claim forms for disability living allowance, motability vehicles, etc. One of David's long held wishes was to be able to attend the remembrance parade at the Senator, particularly as both of his sons had followed him in, into the military. And it's something that he really, really wanted to do. And this is something that Blesma allowed David and one of his sons to fulfill. David sadly passed away in 2016, leaving his widow, Margaret. Blesma offers support to the widows of our members because we recognize the sacrifice that carers, partners, spouses, and loved ones make when helping to look after somebody with limb loss. Since David passed away, Margaret's benefited from a number of Blesmer activities, uh, a seniors week, activities week, and she's been to members weekend a couple of times to really engage in that fellowship, that shared experience. And normally at this point in a presentation, the person giving the talk would say, and I know from experience just how much that must have meant to David and his wife, Margaret and his family. But on this occasion, I can tell you exactly what that meant to David and his family because David was my dad and Margaret is my mum. And in the top corner, you can see David, who, if I'm quite honest, is a little bit pissed off that having done 27 years in the army, which was the same as me, I got more medals than him. But he did get over it because we were able to march past the senator. So in summary, I hope you have now a better understanding of what Blesma does, who we are, how we support people. And those three examples, Michelle, Reg and David, really sum up what we do, how we do it, but more importantly, how your time, your offer is helping us to support our members. Um, and on their behalf, I'd like to thank you very much. Um, I took that picture of all those people sweating in the gym. Uh, and the reason for that is because I don't like being in the gym. Um, I am now happy to take any questions um, and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much for listening. Brian, thank you so much. That was um, actually really emotional. I don't know about others, but I found myself with the odd tear in my eye. I still feel quite emotional hearing some of those stories. And, um, and yeah, to finish with one that's completely personal to you is, is incredible. Um, I've written some notes, but I'm just sort of talking now from, from the heart. Um, what you guys do just is, well, it just blows me away. I think, um, you know, you're clearly looking after sort of the whole individual and their families. Um, so, you know, I think what, what can happen or what I think can often happen is people feel passed from pillar to post. 
Mm. Um, and it's really brilliant that you have an organisation there that that kind of either prevents that from happening, but is there to support them the whole way through and then just carries on. Um, loved hearing Michelle's story. Hopefully we'll get we'll get sight of that as well. And we can put it in our our very own newsletter, which um, Jennifer, the immediate past master, instigated and which is still carrying on because I think that others of our members would love to hear that as well. Uh, um, absolutely. And well, I've, I've spoken to Michelle to get her consent. First of all, yeah, to I mean, obviously, consent. absolutely. Yeah. And she is, yeah. she's absolutely she'd be delighted for for myself and our um, kind of in-house journalist. That's not a proper title anymore, John, is it? But um, content and stories person. Um, we will go to the next fitting uh, in a couple of weeks time uh, and we'll go to the final fitting and we'll. Yeah. We'll cobble together a story um, that that we can put in our magazine, and then you can have a, a you know. and any photos that she's happy for you to take that, yeah, that can be absolutely. shared as well. I know that people would be really interested to hear. Um, I mean, I don't know whether people have got questions. I'm sure there are there are some hanging around. Um, Raymond's hanging around, isn't he? Well, Raymond's still hanging. Do you know what I was going to? I was going to say Raymond's still upside down, but um, but yeah, um, I mean, I, I know that um, while people are perhaps thinking, I had one you you sort of touched on it very very early on and briefly that obviously Blesma incorporates the foreign servicemen and women, and that there's a sort of centralised support. But how how do they get support? if they're outside of the UK, because obviously perhaps they might not have such great facilities like the DMRC. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a really pertinent question, actually. And fundamentally, the anyone who joins the British military from overseas um, absolutely have the, the, the right to, to go back to their, um, their, their, their home country of origin, uh, if they so wish. If they've been if they've been injured as a result of their military service, so for example in Afghanistan or Iraq, um, then there is a very comprehensive support package. Uh, the Gurkhas have a Gurkha welfare organisation that support uh, Gurkhas or Nepalese that go back to Nepal. Um, and the, the through the Veterans Agency or Veterans UK, their, their financial stability is kind of assured through their compensation package and support. The reality is, of course, you know, that limb centres there are limb centres in Nepal but they just cannot offer the same standard of mm. care and service that that they would get here in the UK or, or more developed countries so often they will um, they will choose to stay in the UK um, particularly the Gurkhas there's been recent media about um, some Fijian soldiers who've been faced with large uh, bills from the NHS um, which which is unfortunate, but there are mechanisms to prevent that happening. And, and those individuals probably just weren't given the right support. Um, but as a country, we do our best to support them. But what we do as a charity, uh, we we don't have a network of support officers that operate overseas. That that's, It's just not financially viable. Uh, I do keep asking to go and visit them all at least once, but that doesn't wash either. Um, but they are able to contact us um, and I will work closely with um, experts in particularly in prosthetics here in the UK so that we can give advice as to what they should be saying to their prosthetic provider, whether it be in Germany, Canada or wherever. Um, and for those who don't have access to funding from the Veterans UK, um, as a charity, we do have members who've chosen to move overseas uh, once they've left the services, become amputees later in life. Um, and, and we we will look at that on an individual basis and, and, and we have on occasions um, funded prosthetic provision for those that live overseas, mm. because what they would get from the state um, as kind of, um, you know, regards of their legal status, their, their access to what the state provision might be is far below what it would be if they stayed in the UK. Yeah, yeah, and we, yeah. we will, we will, where possible, we will try and give them the best, best opportunities. Mm. No, great, thank you. Does anyone, does anyone else have any questions? Looks like John's got his hand up. For, oh. um, yeah, and then, and then our immediate past master also had a, a question as well. Um, if I might go first, if you don't mind, Jennifer. Um, Sarah, I, I don't really have a question for Brian. Um, I think you'd be surprised if I did, but um, I just wanted to uh, 
rather than a question offering you something of an explanation this isn't part of the management supervision process in uh, <laughs> Blesma um, but I wanted to come along and um, and hear uh, Brian's presentation and join him um, to thank you um, for your kind offer and the support that you've given to us. It's, it's, it's making a difference already. And as you've heard from Brian far more eloquently than you would hear from me, um, this is genuinely life changing and um, it will continue to make a difference. And so I wanted to be here personally and to thank you. And, and if it is necessary to give you a reassurance that I don't habitually spy on my employees, um, I hope that helps. Thank you. I should think that gives Brian confidence. <laughs> my spying bit. <laughs> Jennifer, you had a question. Thank you, Master. Um, just to say, I think that was an absolutely superb presentation, Brian. I mean, I'm fortunate to have heard a bit before, but I thought the way that you rounded it off and the, the personal level made it so, so mesmerising, really, in every sense. And just to say, is there any... I'm delighted that, that this has all worked out, as the Master said, it's a wonderful thing. Is there anything else practical that, that not the pattern makers, that individuals could do to help? in any way going forward? Uh, there's, there's one main thing actually, um, and, and I didn't, didn't put it in the main part of the presentation uh, or in any specific terms, but actually just sharing the information, sharing the knowledge that Blesmer exists because you know, there are about 185, 187 amputations a week in the UK alone, directly linked to diabetes. You can almost double that if you include you know, other forms of vascular or peripheral arterial disease. Cost the NHS 10 billion pounds a year, you know, one and a half million pounds a, 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 a day or a week or something is ridiculous. But if you look at the demographics involved, it's predominantly older men who have a sedentary lifestyle, which puts those that completed national service right in the bracket of being at risk of diabetes. So, and a lot of national service men just do not identify themselves as veterans because they didn't choose to join the military. They were conscripted through national service, but they are absolutely in the bracket for um, being at risk. So a practical thing that you can do is just speak to your friends, your colleagues, family members, and just see if they know anyone who's served in the military at any point and if they have just make them aware of Blesma because when the time comes that they might need our support we will absolutely be there to support them but we can only support them if they come to us because we don't we don't go around with a net looking for them um, we do get referrals directly from limb centers who now all ask the question have you served but actually you know word of mouth from anybody and everybody is just really helpful mm. thank you let's spread the word yeah no definitely does anybody else have any any questions they would like to ask brian or john while they're both here if somebody would like to suggest that it'd be a really good idea for brian to go and visit his overseas members that that, that might be <laughs> i think it'd be a really good idea brian if you go and visit your overseas members <laughs> anyone if there's well if there's no more if there are if there are no no questions from uh from the floor brian really just and i know i speak on behalf of jennifer as well just a, a huge huge thank you for for talking to us um it's absolutely opened up my eyes and i'm sure it has everybody else's just what an amazing job you guys are doing um, and just echoing Jennifer, I think it's fantastic that we've we've got a, a partnership going. I think as pattern makers, we like making new partnerships. So you know, we're we're in the business of finding finding things that link with our charitable giving and our foundation. And this this absolutely falls into that. So um, so delighted to to, have, to see this up and running, really. Um, so and thank you so much for giving up your time. So really, really interesting. So thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, good. Thank you all. Bye, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the evening and thank you.